Next Village San Francisco is a local nonprofit providing services and support that empowers seniors to live independently in their own homes. We welcome people who want to keep connected with their community as members, volunteers, and supporters. We host 30 to 40 free activities and events each month for the public, and our members have access to our network of volunteers. Learn more and get involved at nextvillagesf.org. We hope you enjoy this video. Today's name is Jampa Sangha. Jampa is a very, very common Buddhist name. Maybe you've heard it before sometimes, and it means loving kindness. My it was my teacher's name who gave me robes. Uh, I've been an uh, ordained and trained nun for 15 years. For those of you who maybe know a little bit about Tibetan Buddhism, I am in the same tradition as His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Don't, I'm not comparing myself in any way. I'm just in that long line, you know, with these simple robes. We do have the same robes, you know, but, but anyway, just to know that. And I have had the privilege of studying with both His Holiness the Dalai Lama and, and maybe some of you know, I'm trying to uh, highlight teachers that most people know of, uh, who just passed away just a year ago, the great Venerable Chit Nhat Han from Vietnam. So I study both Buddhist philosophy and meditation with both of them. And then this will tell you just a lot about me. I came to meditation in the mid 60s. So maybe like some of you, and I don't know if it was 64, 65, but let me just say, I did not know hardly anything. I mean, I got a mantra and, you know, I kind of wound my way here. So it was a long journey, needless to say. So I just want to talk a little bit um, about, um, you know, we're 11 days into the new year. It's been a wet and wild ride here in San Francisco. Right. But every day I notice the New York Times, which I do read, uh, has an article about how to improve ourselves. Okay, we can diet more, we can exercise more, we can be kinder to ourselves, we can give up drinking. I mean, it's all over the place. And so, <laughs> and so, well, there's an article on that in the New York Times, and they want to use mindfulness, which is, that's a whole other big subject. But uh, what I want to say is it's a time, all of these new years, there's many of them, many different calendars, but the common calendar that we use, you know, people are reflective. We're just a little bit of reflective, right? About how life is going for us and how we can be better. So for me, this is a great time of year to come back to the basics. So I, I am one of these people who likes foundation, basics, ha things that have worked. I like things that have worked across continents for 2,600 years. I'm all in for that, you know, where I can see the evidence right in front of me. Yeah, you know, that's working for them. So what I'm gonna talk about today is the foundation of what the historical Buddha taught us and how we can integrate it. You don't have to be Buddhist. You definitely don't have to be monastic. That is definitely not required. And all of this can, enhance our life. And it certainly enhanced my life even before I was a nun. So I just want to start with that. Now, in traditional Buddhism, we always start a talk and end a talk a certain way. So I'm just going to do that so that you kind of have the flavor of that. We start with our intention. So my intention today is to be of some little benefit it's already been a benefit for me to prepare this talk and remind myself of certain things that I'm like, you know, maybe I should pay more attention to that this year. So it's already benefited me and I'm hoping that it will benefit you maybe a little bit, okay? So let's start with the historical Buddha. I imagine many of you know this story. So, you know, you either saw it on NPR and it was, you know, narrated by Richard Gere, who's a very well-known student of the Dalai Lama and other teachers. And, um, or, you know, maybe you saw Keanu Reeves in that movie that he was a Buddha. <laughs> so you probably have it, but let's, let's just talk about it in terms of foundation. So I'm going to start with a little story. Um, so the Buddha passed a man on the road. 
Okay, and the man was so struck by this extraordinary radiance of this being in front of him and peaceful. And so he said, hey, uh, my friend, are you a celestial being or a god, you know? And the Buddha said, no, no, I'm not. And then he said, well, are you a magician or a wizard? And he said, no. No, I'm not that either, right? Are you a man? And this is interesting. He said, no. Okay. He said, well, my friend, then what are you? And the Buddha replied, I am awake. I am awake. <laughs> and the Bo what Buddha, Buddha means is the awakened one. So the whole fundamental of all this meditation that we do or know about, all of this comes down to the ultimate goal of the path, which is awakening. So what that is a big topic, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And what the Buddha offers is not only can he did he awake, yay, yay him, right? 2,600 years ago, fantastic. <laughs> but that it is the potential of all sentient beings, which that means all of you. All of you have the capacity to become a Buddha, every single one of you, which is, hey, that's good news, right? I think it's good news. Doesn't mean you want to, I'm just saying that you can, right? So um, let's just talk a little bit about how he got there. Let's talk about the typical story. So he was born in a kingdom. He was born right below the Himalayas. His father was the chief of the Shaki clan. He was born, you know, in this ancient kingdom. His father was probably an oligarch or an elected chiefdom of the Shaki clan. That's probably really more what it was like. And 12 years, as you probably heard before he was born, this Brahmin predicted that he would either be a great sage, yay, or, um, you know, he would run, he would be like, you know, a monarch. Uh, and a universal monarch, you know, rule everything. Well, you know, his dad was like, the last thing he wanted was like his son to become a, an aesthetic, like these wandering sadhus out there. You know, that was not what he wanted. So he uh, confined him to the palace, we know, and, you know, let him study all these great things, have all the pleasures of life, food, everything, education, but not about the world. And he then got married and he had a son. But he was like many of us. He was a seeker. You know, he was like, maybe there's something more, right? Even though he had, by all standards, everything in the current world that he lived in. So he goes out with the chariot driver and he sees famously the sick man. He sees the old man. He sees the corpse on the way to the funeral pyre. And the chariot driver, he asked him, what is all this? He had never seen it before. And he was quite disturbed by the experience. And the chariot driver told him, it is the nature of all beings to be born, to age, and to be sick. So you can imagine, if you didn't really know that, it's pretty disturbing. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, think about it. Let's just go with the story, right? And uh, so nothing had prepared him. All right, nothing had prepared him. And on the way back to the palace on one of these trips, he sees the sadhu, the sage. He sees the aesthetic with an arms ball and looking very peaceful. This is very important in Buddhism. It has a lot of implications on monasticism. Anyway, so he sees that and now he goes back to the palace and he decides that he wants to know what is this suffering? How, how is it that we find ourselves here? And how can we rid ourselves of it? So quietly, you know, he says goodbye to, without waking them to his child and to his wife. And he goes off into the forest. And like a lot of men at that time, he went in looking for liberation. There was quite a few aesthetics at that time. Cut his hair wore the robes. Uh, they weren't so nice like this. Most of the robes came from charnel grounds, old fiber, and they put it together. And so he studied with a couple of teachers. So he already, so he goes and he finds these two great teachers 
and he studies meditation with them. One was Arada Kamala. He had about 300 followers and he studied with him. He learned discipline from him. So that's very important, discipline for all of us. You know, we never learn anything unless we kind of reel ourselves in and have a little discipline. We all know that. So he learned that. And they also learned how to enter into the sphere of nothingness. So we're not quite at awakening yet, which we call in Tibetan Buddhist emptiness, right? So he leaves, even though this teacher said, you can stay with me and you can teach, you know, you can be an equal to me. And he goes, no, this, he kept going. So then he's with the Radha Ramaputra and he learns about concentration. This is another thing we need, particularly as meditators, we need discipline, we need concentration to be able to stay on the object. And again, he left, so he goes off. So for six years, I think this is important, six years. So it took the Buddha six years, you know, because I know when I teach meditation and people, and even for myself at times, it's like, well, when, when is the great stuff going to kick in, you know? And it's like, well, I'm not a Buddha. It's probably going to take a little bit longer, right? It, obviously it's going to take longer. And so uh, he goes for six years with five friends. And then, you know, if you look at it, you see where he got so thin, he did these extreme things and you see those statues and pictures of his ribs. And so now he makes a decision, he's almost near death. He makes a decision that he is going to take some food, some nourishment. And Sujata, this woman in his close village, offers him a dish of milk and some a vessel of honey. And he, he, when his uh, friends find out about this, now maybe we've all had friends like this, right? Where friends are like, I'm sorry, you're not keeping your vows good enough, or you're not doing the right thing. And they just abandoned him. They just took off, right? They said, you're, you're not doing the right thing, right? So he does eat this milk and honey and his strength returns. He washes himself off in the river and he sets off to the Bodhi tree. And there's a mat of kusha grass. And this is, I think, always important too, because he sat there and now, just like all of us, we're older, maybe not that old, a few of us, <laughs> but, uh, no, but older. <laughs> but we have an education, we learn certain things, but ultimately in Buddhism, it comes down to your practice, your mind. You have to do it yourself. There's no transmission. I wish it was that easy. I wish, you know, like, the Dalai Lama could just, you know, hey, Joppa, you know, wake up. But it was, it's not that easy. So we're working with our mind. So here's the Buddha. He's, he knows that there's more, but he has to find it himself. So he goes and he is determined and he sits there for six days. And he opens his eyes on the, on the rising morning star and he realizes the ultimate awakening. Okay, what he's been looking for. Wonder of wonders, this is the very enlightenment, is the nature of, again, all beings. That means all of you and myself, although I have not reached that state, obviously. <laughs> so, uh, you know, seriously, I mean, you haven't, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so he uh, was 35 years old. So for seven days, he just kind of enjoyed the tranquility. So, and he thought that it was so subtle and out of the ordinary, his experience that most people couldn't understand it. You know, it would be too difficult. So legend has it, let's just go with the myth that the God Brahma, Shamapati intervened and asked him to teach, okay? So he decides he's going to, right? His two former teachers had passed away the week before. So he's not going back to teach with them. So he would sought out his five friends who took off, were not happy about him. And the five friends are at Deer Park. So we're on our way to Deer Park now and we're going to have the very first teaching. And that's where we're gonna learn how to make a happier life. 
So he gets up there and they're, they decide they're going to ignore him. You ever have people that want to ignore you? You can see it when you're coming. They're like, oh, well, I don't, you know, you ever have to, or maybe you've been the person who've ignored. We've kind of been that way too, particularly when we're young, you know. So um, they ignore him, but then they see this radiance. So they make they wash his feet. They make a, a a seat for him. They do all of the niceties, and he gives his first sermon, which is the four noble truths. So why is this important? This is important because we have this being who says, who says to us, we can have this ultimate awakening, this peace, Ooh. this serenity, and what how to get there how to get there we need a plan right we need a better plan than just you know sitting under some tree particularly on a rainy day where it could fall on it. it's not a good idea right so after so this is the for 45 years he taught all over india but this teaching the four noble truths is the foundation of all of that okay it's the very first and I'm going to, we're going to talk about it. And the reason it's important was not only did it liberate him, it can liberate us, even in very small ways, in every ordinary day ways, because otherwise, what's the point? You know, there we are. We need to be able to get on with it, be a little bit happier. So, all right, you might ask, why, why four noble truths? Why not 104? Why not 10? Why not 10? Why not, you know? Come on, the Ten Commandments, that was good. Moses did a good job, you know? So oh, okay. why not, why not, right? But the reason is Buddhism has always had this kind of intermingling with science, uh, the science of the day. Science now, maybe many of you know about the Mind Life Conference that Dalai Lama does. I've taught with scientists. And so, you know, we have a lot of interest from both psychologists and, and um, linguists and neurologists that are interested in meditation and that type of thing. So the reason there's four is the science of the day was based upon the four elements, earth, wind, you know, that kind of thing. They were based on the four elements. So that's why there's four. So many times you see the Buddhist thought of as a doctor and that's how medicine was practiced back then too. So what's the first noble truth? So this first noble truth gets a lot of baggage. People are like, I don't know about this Buddhist stuff, these suffering people, what's wrong with them? So let's think about what we're trying to do. We're trying to have a life of more ease, more benefit to ourselves, to others, Ow. kinder life, happier life, right? This is what we all want. This is what New York Times is talking about every day. So in order to do that, we have to define the problem, right? Because we can't solve a problem if we don't define a problem. So the problem is, is there is suffering, okay? Now, in truth, this word has way more baggage than the intention of this. So the Sanskrit word is dukkha, maybe you've heard that. But I talked to Bhikkhu Bodhi, one of our great translators, and uh, who has translated so many Buddhist texts. And he always says, and I believe Venerable Anilio does too, that unsatisfactoriness is really where we, what the Buddha is talking about. That kind of pervasive, unsatisfied, unsatisfactoriness that happens. Oh, I like and, that. Yeah, it's a great, and that is the proper translation, according to these two great translators, because translation's tricky. Maybe some of you are translators, you know that. And um, so the Buddha says, and I, uh, you know, birth, aging, death, these are all, you know, we could say that's suffering. We could use that word maybe there. But then the union of what is displeasing, flooding, I'm dissatisfied with the flooding, you know, or separation from what is pleasing, separation from our loved ones or things that we desire, these types of things, right, are also, you know, they're hard for us. They're a little, you know, we have a little angst about it. Not getting what we want. Yeah, not getting what we want. So this is what he's talking about. It's not a pessimistic 
point of view. It's realistic. It's just looking at the way life is. Everything is impermanent. Everything is interconnected. But this impermanency starts to cause us this dissatisfaction when we have to let go of things. Mm. So that we are defining the problem, okay? So now we know the problem. We have this pervasive sense of dissatisfaction. We all know that, right? We all know when we don't get what we want, it's not great. We all know when somebody says something to us hurtful, you know, it's not great. You know, all of these things. There are a lot of ways that things are dissatisfying. So once we understand that, now we're gonna to move to the second noble truth that he talks about. And this is, what's the cause of it? Why, why do we even have this? What's up? Why, why do we have this dissatisfaction? Okay, why is that? So let's pause here for a minute, just step into the religion of Buddhism. You don't have to believe, it's really not required, but just to get a flavor that remember that Buddhism believes in rebirth, okay? So one of the things when the Buddha does, he awakens, he, he frees himself from further rebirth, where they're being in this state of dissatisfaction. But, so let's come back to the origin of this dissatisfaction. And so I wanna say uh, the origin is craving. I have no okay. craving. Craving, no. craving. I don't. Wanting, have. desire. All of those things, even on the most subtle level, craving, desire, wanting, wanting things to be different. If I just had, if I just was, if I had just done, if I just could, you know, all of that is dissatisfaction. And when we recognize each one of us is unique, each one of us comes to it maybe a little bit differently. So if you're a meditator, remember that meditation is to become familiar with the mind, not just on the cushion, but all day long, to become familiar. So we look at how we crave. So if I go to the bakery and since, and I have to wait in line, you know, lots of people, and I see through the window, what am I craving? Hmm. Could be so many things. Could be the cheesecake, could be the carrot cake. You know, I have my own thing going on over there, right? And, you know, wow, I hope they don't run out, right? Or what if they run out? So these little craving moments is to become familiar with how your mind works. And if you look at the society that we live in, we're up against these consumer psychologists who have spent decades understanding what the Buddha understood. There is a pervasive sense of dissatisfaction. If you were just thinner, if you were just prettier, if you would just get a facelift, if you would just, you know, get a body, whatever, you know, now we're like doing all these things to the body that we never did before, you know? And so, you know, there's all this kind of stuff going on saying, yeah, then you're gonna be happy. I guarantee it, right? Well, we all know that's not true, right? But, you know, you need another outfit, right? You need this, you need that. These are the things we're up against. And that's because fundamentally, we all are a little bit this way. So as we become familiar with it, we get to know it. And that once we know something, so now we recognize, oh, this is the cause of why I suffer uh, in this situation. Okay, so, and I also like the word, instead of craving, you could do thirsting. I like that word too, you're thirsting for it. You know, I always think that's a good translation as well. So it is at this point that we have a little bit of an over-reliance on pleasure. Look, at we all want pleasure. And, and we're not saying that there aren't pleasurable things in life. Enjoy them. In fact, be really present for that cheesecake that you get at the bakery. Enjoy every bite. When you go to dinner with your group, go and enjoy every bite. Savor every moment of it, the friendship, the smells, the whatever it is, savor it. But you, 
it's impermanent. And so we enjoy it while it's there. And then we go on to whatever else, right? We don't cling to it. We don't try and recreate it. So that's basically what it's talking about. And then the third noble truth is the end of suffering. Cool. Now we're going to put it into it, right? Let's do that. We're going to eliminate it because now we know how it works in our mind. So my mind's different than all of yours, but not that different, you know, but different. And, um, and so I know in my mind how it works, how I make myself suffer if I don't do certain things or, you know, if I don't catch things at a certain time. But now if we're really familiar with all of this, we're really watching our minds, then we can start to eradicate it, right? So the noble truth of the cessation of suffering, everything is fading away, everything is impermanent. So we can't cling to anything. It's a good way to start letting go. And, we, and to not have reliance on certain things. And as we give up these patterns that we all come with, as we give them up, we ease our suffering and we become, our life becomes easier. It's just easier. We just have, it flows a little bit better. So now here's the fourth noble truth. And it's leading to how are we going to fine tune all of this? And it's called the eight noble path. Maybe some of you have heard it. So I'm going to go through it. And this is what I want to say. I have this nun friend. I have a lot of nun friends, but some of them she sometimes would um, take one of these eight and work on it for a while, you know? And uh, so she basically, one of them, the third one, so I'm going to just jump and then I'll go back to and put them in order. But like, let's say speech. Speech is a really interesting thing. So you know, sometimes we're not very good with our speech. You know, maybe we're tired and we're a little cranky. Maybe, maybe I'm just that way. Maybe not you guys. Maybe you're never that way. But, you know, our speech maybe is a little short or maybe we have trouble talking to certain people or, you know, maybe you have an annoying person in your life. Maybe not. I do, but maybe you don't. <laughs> but so, you know, we're, we're, you know, it's like, well, I really got to watch my speech with this. So she would actually just really bring it to the forefront of like, you know, I'm going to work on that for about 30 days or whatever, you know, just to become more familiar, particularly with maybe a situation you have trouble with. Why is it that that bothers me? And how can I, on my end, be more compassionate, more tolerant, have more compassionate speech? So that's one way to work with these. So the first noble truth is the right view. So that comes back to the first noble truth, right view. So we're on that uh, eightfold path. It's like, oh, this type of this enchantment, this type of, of pervasive dissatisfaction, it's kind of there a lot. And, and by becoming by changing our view that it, do, it doesn't have to be there. I, I can eliminate that by becoming familiar, by doing certain practices. So it's just starting to see reality too. Uh, maybe I didn't say the Buddha, when he awakened, he awakened to the way things are. Not, not the way we want them to be, but the way they actually are. And in that, the true nature of who we are, we can be liberated. Our true nature, all this other stuff, this robes, Venable, Trampa, my lay name, all those things, that's not our ultimate identity or who we are. We are the potential Buddhist, all of us. So having that view of, okay, I want to walk on this earth in a more peaceful, more compassionate, more loving way, right view. So right thought, right resolve, you know, so in order to follow that, we need to kind of think about no ill will. Okay, well, that's maybe we have some ill will. That's a normal human thing. It happens. But then 
to notice it and try and switch it, try and find out why we have it, just to investigate. You know, when you're as you're whether you do contemplation meditation or sitting meditation, whatever, to just investigate. But when it's actually happening, ill will, you know, oh, I feel some ill will right now. Just to get to know it, not be afraid of it, not judge it, not make it a job, not think you're a horrible person, none of that. Just to become familiar because this is how we loosen things up. It's how we do it, by knowing it, by seeing it. So it's important to be a little more um, loving to ourselves, too. Not to be rigid about anything that doesn't get us anywhere, really. And so I talked about right speech. You know, um, we're big in Buddhism. I just want to say this. We're really big on not lying. Duh. You know, like every faith. You know, don't lie. Don't cheat. You know, all of these things. Uh, we're really, we're really big in that. And, you know, we all know that that's a good way to be, to be an honest person, to be as honest as possible. That's a, so that's something that we're, and it makes your life easier if you're honest. And if you're honest with yourself, it makes your life easier. It doesn't mean you have to go around and confess things. I mean, it's not that kind of thing. And then on right conduct, the other thing we're really big on is not killing okay we're we're not into that at all and i know how to carry out so many insects and put them on my deck i have learned over the years i'm very good at capturing different types of insects and getting them outside and you know we do our best to not injure not take what is not given stealing we don't steal that's not a good thing to be doing. And then we don't uh, engage in sexuality that causes harm. Okay, and we all know what those things are. So, you know, if it causes harm, that's something that uh, as monastics, we are celibate, but in lay life, you know, you just don't engage in those. And then what is your livelihood? What do you do for a living? And so many livelihoods are for benefit. You know, I think about particularly during COVID, I think about all the delivery people that have been a benefit. So many, you know, out there in these storms and, and particularly during the first of COVID, you know, I mean, where they were, had to make a living. And I mean, my gosh, we would, I don't know what we would have done without them. You know, you can see how interconnected we all are. We learned a lot about that, about the interconnectivity of all of us during COVID. If we didn't know it before, we see, you know, just we learned a lot about supply chains. We've learned all of that. Many of us already understood the fact that we're all connected. But it's just to think about what is your livelihood? How are you in the world? What do you do? You know, that's all, trying to not do harm. That's really what it means. Right, effort. Oh, effort's a really funny thing, don't you think? I think effort is such a funny thing. So um, effort, I find, I can make a big deal out of effort. I'm like, oh, that is just, that's gonna be too hard for me. I, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know, maybe not, you know? But what I find sometimes the mind just needs a little, you know, a little tap and it can go right over and it will do what it's supposed to do. I think that's why we make lists too, you know, cause then it's like there and we'll get it done. I noticed that I have that from all my years of, of training. So, um, so we just want to do wholesome mm. acts. That's basically what we're trying to do. Kind acts, wholesome acts, that's all. You know, it's pretty easy. Right, right mindfulness. Okay, mindfulness. It's a big word, isn't it? What does it mean? I used to know. 20 years ago, I could have told you exactly what it means. But now when I go to Whole Foods, they make you wait in line. And it's by all the ice cream and all that kind of stuff. And I want you to know that I love when I see this, that their whole <laughs> Whole Foods has it has mindfulness sugar and they had the audacity to charge $2 more for this mindfulness sugar. 
uh, there uh, than the regular sugar. I bought it because I was going to be teaching mindfulness eating with my friend. And so I love these kinds of things. And then about four weeks ago, I was there and uh, I'm in the ice cream and there's enlightenment ice cream and it was on sale for $4.99. And I, so I photographed it and sent it to my friend, Venable Carol, and I go, what do you think? $4.99, if this works, we're home free, you know? So these words are out there, mindfulness, you know, enlightenment, you know, obviously if you eat $4.99 ice cream, it's, it's not gonna help. And I don't care even if it was $10.99, it wasn't gonna get you in life, but it might taste good. And so one of the things that probably some of you, not maybe younger ones here, but our age, remember when Zen, everything was Zen candles, Zen plants, Zen soap, you know, all of these things. And so now the, the powers that be that advertise have given Zen back to Zen. So yay Zen people, because they had to put up with this for a long time. And now they've co-opted mindfulness and it's gotten so bad that the New York Times, and that's why I mentioned drinking, whoever said, you're not required to give up drinking. Uh, had an article about mindfully giving up drinking. When I told my nun friends about this, they, they were horrified because it, 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 the two are counterproductive, you know? I mean, it's like, yeah, I'm gonna drink a bottle of wine in my head. No, that's not gonna be happening. And mindfulness is, you know, it's just, it just, I don't know. It's just all over the place. But 20 years ago, what it really meant was it is a, that kind of energy, this mindfulness from the meditation, that when you kind of get the concentration where it needs to be, not too, too laxicity, not too tight, and it moves it forward. So it, it, it was that. And now it just seems like another word for awareness. That's what it seems like to me, but I don't know. Um, so, but right mindfulness basically means that you're using both these tools of discipline and concentration, right mindfulness, to move the mind, to become more familiar with the mind, really get to know it, and then to eradicate whatever is not beneficial and really water the seeds, as Tit and Han used to say, of what is beneficial, and then really protect those little sprouts and really take care of all that good stuff as it's getting a better place and more solidly in your mind. And the same with right samadhi, which is again, basically what I'm talking about. So, so that's after you've been on the path for a while and your, you know, your meditations are really good. But this is what I wanna to say too, is it's very difficult. You know, it doesn't mean because you're a nun that you're a great meditator or that you, you know, some people come to it with, you know, we would say karma or causes and conditions, that's all karma means, is, um, and they just have an affinity for it. They're, they're good at it. Uh, just like we're all good at certain things. There are certain things we come with. And for others like myself, it's more of a, it's more of a process. It takes a while, it takes a long time. So I, I don't claim to know <laughs> where each one of you are at if you do have a practice. But what I can talk about is being, familiar with the mind and how to use these tools to eradicate and move to a better life. And that's, that's been my um, uh, experience. And I can talk a little bit about that. But before I do, I just want to see if uh, it makes sense and if there's any uh, comments or questions from anybody. Um, no. A lot of you are on mute, so if you um, are trying to say something and aren't hearing response, just make sure to turn off the mute setting on Zoom. But I don't see any questions in the chat right now. Good. Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> all right. So, all right. All right. So I'm going to tell you how I, on a really kind of um, insightful, before I was a nun, okay, before I was a nun, I lived uh, in Santa Cruz, California, which just got slammed for a long, long time, almost 25 years. So before I was a nun, uh, I, came, um, I came from a really impatient family. Everybody was impatient. You could, if you could give that family an award, 
like for the most impatient family. Maybe one of you guys, we could debate it, like who's with more. But they were pretty impatient, I want to say that. And I had that tendency myself. But by this time, I have taken refuge, which means you're Buddhist. So I've taken refuge with this amazing Reba Rinpoche, such an amazing being. And so, uh, but I still have this problem with impatience. So I'm off to Santa Cruz and I'm off to Trader Joe's at Christmas time at around, must have been around 4.30, 5 o'clock. Why I was doing something like this, I have no idea. And, uh, but I remember it was kind of dark, it was getting dark. And I don't know about here, but in Santa Cruz, the parking lot is, a, it's too small for Trader Joe's. It's just like bumper cars, you know, like you would see. So first I get there and I can barely get a space, right? So that, that starts the night, right? Now I get in there and it's a small, you know, Santa Cruz, it's small Trader Joe's. We had two, but this was the smaller one. And so I go about getting my stuff. All right. Now, and it's packed with people. And the first thing that's happening to me is so I'm filling it up and I'm noticing what everybody's feeling. And then my mind is so judgmental. I'm like, really? That's the amount of alcohol you need to get through the holidays? Wow. Really? You can't chop your own vegetables. Now we just like buy them chop. I mean, just going on and on in my head. I'm not saying anything. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's a little miss nice, right? But in my head, I've got all this judgment going on like you can't believe. Now I get to the back of the line to go and I'm in line. It's the longest line. I had never been that far back in a line in the store. I'm all the way for the first time. Now I know where the bathrooms were. I never knew where they were before. So now I'm in the line and the guy way up in front who's doing the checkout is this guy from typical Santa Cruz, really kind of friendly, tattoos everywhere, you know, kind of cute and total flirt guy. He is flirting with everybody. Boy, he doesn't care who you are, taking up all this time. And I am like, are you kidding me? This is the line I'm in? right so now i'm judging everybody i'm in this line i am already like pissed off about this and then all of a sudden as i'm probably thinking something horrible i go oh my god you're buddhist what's wrong with you what is wrong with you what is up get it together and i thought wow this is not good this is really not good and so I vowed that day to say to myself, you know what? Every time I come to Trader Joe's, I'm going to practice patience. I'm going to learn why I'm so impatient. I don't understand how my mind gets, runs away. So dissatisfied. I mean, who cares? I was part of the problem. I'm in the line. I'm, my car's in the parking lot. I'm picking out stupid foods too, you know? So, and it was all delusion. I was so wrong about everything and I'll explain it. But one of the big things I was wrong about, this was when those little carrots came out. You remember those? And I was like, really? We can't like peel our own carrots now? Turns out the man who invented those came from either Pepsi or Coca-Cola. And he was such a great man that he wanted to do something good because of working with the soft drink people. And he wanted to do this and he felt, and he was right, more people would eat vegetables. He was like a bodhisattva. He was, and I'm like complaining about it in my head. I have no idea the motivation. See, like we talked about, his motivation was so kind. I didn't see it. I didn't understand it. I was ignorant and making myself unhappy. So after doing this, I did this for quite some time. Every time I would go there, I went there a lot when I lived in Santa Cruz, it was on my way home. And, um, and what I learned, I learned some things about myself. I learned number one, when I'm tired, I get really cranky mm -hmm. as I've gotten older. I learned that. I'm just tired. And then so I said, well, I'm not gonna go when I'm tired. 
That's easy to solve, right? So with everything, I learned when you're tired, not a good time to go to Trader Joe's. But I also learned that when I was up unhappy with something, that I skipped over being tired because I don't like fatigue. Funny, I have, it's a big part of my life now as I've aged, but I don't like fatigue. I, don't, I have an aversion to it. So I had to make peace with that too. And then after, I don't know how long, I don't get impatient anymore. And if I do, I check. I'm usually tired or I'm not feeling well. And then I can just take care of that. So it was so simple, but I didn't realize, and I was causing my own suffering. So here's the noble truth. I learned it. I paid attention to it. I eradicated it. I solved it. But when I occasionally get impatient, then I know something's off. And so I taught my nephews about this. And one of my, I have five nephews, they're all in LA. One of them called me and he was, he had a new job in Santa Barbara. He lived in Long Beach. So it was big. He had to go up there a couple of days a week. He goes, Auntie, I'm practicing Trader Joe's patience on the 405 in LA, you know? <laughs> so this is how we can start to, I mean, traffic is a great way to learn to practice patience and what works. So this is just a simple thing, but it made my life so much easier, right? So much easier. It was just simple, becoming familiar with the mind. I didn't have to sit on the cushion. I just had to stand at Trader Joe's. And I love that guy that was, I mean, he's so kind. The guy who was, uh, you know, the cash register guy there for so many years. He was so, he looked lovely to everyone. And the, I love the guy that did the carrot. Wow, so mm -hmm. amazing of so much benefit. So these are things where you can take something and just flip it. And that's what I try and do with everything. If I find my speech is off or if I find I'm not doing something or I'm having some kind of suffering. I look deeply, what is it? What can I let go of? What can I, what can I become familiar with so I can tweak it? So I hope that little story helps a little bit in terms of how to do it every day. Mm -hmm. The other thing I, I wanna say that I do in, um, is I do a lot of walking meditation. Okay, so walking meditation is a big subject. It's a little more complex than sitting meditation because it has more movement, the body is moving. And, but I just many times will go left, right. If I find something not going well, I'll just remind myself left, right, left, right, lifting, placing, lifting, placing. Even I, you know, walk around a whole block, you know, and just kind of get the mind more cooled down. So all of these little things we can do. We don't have to sit for hours and hours. I've certainly done that. And I think that's great if you want to do that, but it's not, it's not necessary if you don't. I, you know, I don't think this kind of practice should be harsh in any way. I think it should be open. And we take this wonderful quality that we all have, which is curiosity and bring it to the most important thing we have, our own mind. Nothing is more important than that. All our potential is there. And so we just bring this curiosity to see how this mind is working in simple and in complex ways. And then our life becomes a little bit easier. Well, we reach enlightenment this is such a big subject, enlightenment. Even, so i just tell you a quick story about the Dalai Lama and then Chodron Rinpoche, who uh, was one of my preceptors. So even the Dalai Lama will not say he's enlightened. He is not awakened. He will not say it, right? And I saw Chodron Rinpoche, one of my preceptors, stop a room when someone asked something to clarify, I did, did not say that I was awakened. I did not say that I have gotten there. We take a, a vow not to say we have attained something we haven't attained. 
But for those scrapings, Chodham Rinpoche did a 20 year retreat in Tibet in a war zone, a silent retreat. So, you know, he was quite accomplished as is the Dalai Lama. So we have to be careful with enlightenment and awakening. And if somebody says that to you, what I would say, I've had people come up and, and tell me they're enlightened as a nun. Usually when I'm buying yogurt at Whole Foods, that's when they'll come up always, or I'm buying apples or something. They'll go, are you a Buddhist nun? And I go, yeah, and they go, I think I'm enlightened. I'm like, let's talk about it. You know, and you, it, it, I've not met one that was yet, but if I do, I'll let you know. Uh, and then we'll all be sitting there. Um, but um, the Dalai Lama always says, and I think uh, I always want to pass this on as well as Chet and Han, you should look at a teacher for at least six, seven, the Dalai Lama once said 12 years to see if they're really who they say they are. So just, you know, and if somebody, so that, that's just a caveat. I always think it's important that we know these are big philosophical issues where people have debated them in Narlanda and all these great, uh, institutions, they have differences in terms of uh, different types of Buddhism. Buddhism is a huge religion like Christianity. You know, in Christianity, you have everything from, you know, Quakers and then Catholicism, you know, Buddhism is a bit like that too. So just to know that there's, it's a big subject, but I'm hoping that for all of us and for myself, my goal this year uh, is to just be a little reflective, to work on some of those things that I feel I like could improve, to become a little bit familiar, more familiar with some of these patterns, which every now and then I find myself in, you know, so that I can, just like in Trader Joe's, I can go, oh, well, I don't have to be impatient anymore. You know, it's not required. So um, that's it pretty much. but. I did tell you at the beginning that um, we always start and end in two ways with Buddhist talks. And so at the end, we dedicate. And when we dedicate, we take all this virtue, all this goodness, all this curiosity and intention. And hopefully, you know, that's hopefully even if one little thing I said was helpful, I hope. And uh, we dedicate it to the whole world. So it's a little bit like making a wish. So wishes are good. I'm always about that. Wishes are a good thing. So think of someone you would want to dedicate all this goodness to. It could be yourself. Maybe you need a little boost right now. I know I did recently. I had to call Shavasti Abbey. And um, so we're going to dedicate it. So let's think of who you want to dedicate it to that, whoever or whatever cause, just think about that for a minute. And then I'm going to dedicate all the virtue to the success of Next Village and all the people that work there and do this good work that they're doing. May they continue to flourish, have all that they need to help everybody, including me. And then for the world at large, may there be peace in this world. May we all find the path to ease, to awakening. May all of you awaken. And so I want to thank you all for your attention and for being here. And I do have a book list. And I just want to talk about that real quickly. Uh, if you're interested, uh, it's there. And one of the things that I wanted to say, these are huge subjects, as you probably know. But on the book list, I, I edited it, but um, it, it says 2016, but I actually edited it yesterday. So on there, there's quite a few things um, that are, that, uh, I mean, I lost myself. Um, uh, did I lose myself? Um, we can still see you okay. Oh, oh, yeah. you can see me. Oh, okay. Can so you... on, yeah, no, fine. 
That's fine. I just didn't know if there was something wrong. All right. So on this book list, there's a couple of things that I wanted to point out. Number one, uh, Buddhism is usually all the teachings are given freely. So there's several websites there. And one is His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. All his teachings are free. They're on YouTube all the time. Maybe you have watched them. You can also, there's a lot on Tit and Han on YouTube. There's quite a bit. Uh, there's Aja Brahm, who's very funny. He's out of Perth, Australia. And then there's uh, my friends up at Shravasti Abbey, uh, Tupton Children. Uh, they do a little talk every single day. There's about 20 monastics up there now. She edits all of His Holiness, not all, but a lot of His Holiness's books and has written books herself. And it is the only abbey uh, in the continental United States, or actually, I think maybe in the Western Hemisphere. So, um, so it's quite an accomplishment. She's a remarkable individual. Uh, so to know that there are some books there that I have read and I always go back to, which I think are really wonderful. Uh, so uh, that's what I'm offering about that. And, um, and so I just offered that up. And uh, if you're curious, you can take a look at what I've read and what I think is important. If you're really into a deep dive, uh, there's there's books in there too. The Nasanti um, Patada Sutra by Venable Analilio. He's a very interesting translator and monk out of Germany. He's done a tremendous amount of research on early Buddhism, but all of the authors are really wonderful. So just know that there's plenty out there. Most of it uh, doesn't cost anything, and but it's always nice if you make an offering to groups that. Thank you for viewing this next Village video recording. We hope you enjoyed it. Please help us spread the word and tell friends and neighbors about Next Village events and services for seniors and adults with disabilities in San Francisco. Visit our website to learn more about our vibrant, growing network, as well as to view our calendar of upcoming Zoom and in-person events and activities in San Francisco. Our website is nextvillagesf.org. Contact us to join our email list to learn about events and resources for seniors in San Francisco. And subscribe to the Next Village YouTube channel by clicking the button below.